Welcome to beautiful Bay City Western High School. Isn't this a lovely space? We're so grateful to Bay City Public Schools for allowing us to use it. Seasons are defined by the calendar and not the weather. So it may seem outside like it's mid-spring, but you are in fact in the right place. This is the classic Legacy Band Winter Concert. <laughs> and while it's lovely outside, it's about to get very windy in here. See what I did? See? Yeah. That's who I am. <laughs> we are very excited to have you here. We're grateful for our sponsors, um, and there's a wonderful lineup that is prepared for you. So let's get to it. Uh, our first number today is called Pink Lemonade. And this arrangement for band by Nicholas Contorno was published in 2010. Contorno was Marquette University's Director of Music Programs for 24 years. He received the Lifetime Achievement in Music Award from the Civic Music Association in 2013. In 2010, a former high school band student of Contorno's opened the Nick Contorno School of Music in Haiti, where that student worked with a nonprofit providing humanitarian aid to the earthquake victims. Prior to his passing, Contorno was known as the Music Man. And we don't have 76 trombones, but there are trombones. Uh, he was the Music Man, or Dr. C, to generations of Marquette University bandos. The welcoming sage who drew them into band, even if they say they didn't play very well. Originally written in 1921 for banjo during the Roaring Twenties, this march was used to accompany acrobats, wild animals, and clowns. Please welcome to the stage the director of the Classic Legacy Band, Mr. David Fitz. Frank Erickson was born in 1923 and raised in Spokane, Washington. He began his instrumental career at the age of eight playing piano and at 10 playing trumpet. In high school, he wrote his first composition for the band. It's okay if you feel unaccomplished now. <laughs> You're just in company with me. 
He has a bachelor's and a master's degree in music from the University of Southern California and spent many years as a professor of music at San Jose State, San Jose State University. He died in 1996. One of the stronger tendencies of 20th century music has been a return to a certain aspects of music of the Baroque and classic periods. Compositions falling into this category are referred to as neoclassic. Air for Band is such a piece. The form binary was quite common in the Baroque period, and the melodies and melody and harmonies were strongly influenced by the works of Bach. The composition begins softly and in a minor key, and by gradually adding instruments and increasing the dynamics and range, the climactic section is reached approximately halfway through. Erickson then uses the opening melody to create interesting rhythms and dialogues between sections on the way to a modulation to a major key and another crescendo leading to a maestoso ending. Air for band. The next medley, arranged by Frank Erickson, includes songs from the musical Man of La Mancha. Inspired by the classic novel Don Quixote by Cervantes, 
1965 musical contains songs composed by Mitch Lee and lyrics by Joe Darian. The story is a play within a play where a man and his servant are thrown into prison during the Spanish Inquisition and defend their innocence by acting out their side of the story. The man renames himself Don Quixote and his servant Sancho Panza and they go off on adventures with the goal of achieving knighthood. Among his adventures, Don Quixote falls for the servant at a local inn who he renames Dulcinea and defends her honor in a battle with his mortal enemy, the Enchanter. This collection of tunes for concert band contains songs from the musical, including Little Bird, Dulcinea, Man of La Mancha, and The Impossible Dream.
The Shenandoah Valley and the Shenandoah River are located in Virginia. There's disagreement among historians concerning the origins of their names. Some claim that the river and valley were named in the 1750s by the Cherokee as a friendly tribute to a visiting Iroquois chief named Skinandoah. Others suggest that the region was not named by the Cherokee, but by the Senado Indians of the Virginia Valley. In Senado tradition, Shenandoah means daughter of the moon and bears no relation to Chief Skenandoah. The origins of the folk song Shenandoah are equally obscure, but all date to the 19th century. It has been attributed variously to a coal miner in Pennsylvania, to a young protege of Stephen Foster, and to a housewife in Lexington, Kentucky. Many variants on the melody and text have been handed down through the years, the most popular telling the story of an early settler's love for a Native American woman. Frank T. Kelly was inspired by the freedom and beauty of the folk melody and by the natural images evoked by the words, especially the image of a river. T. Kelly was less concerned with the sound of a rolling river than with its life-affirming energy its timelessness. Sometimes the accompaniment flows quietly under the melody. Other times it breathes alongside it. The work's mood ranges from quiet reflection through growing optimism to profound exaltation. Shenandoah.
Dedicatory Overture was written by composer Clifton Williams in 1964. Williams was born in Arkansas in 1923 and earned a master's degree in music from the Eastman School of Music, where he studied under Pulitzer Prize winner and director of the school, Howard Hansen. Hansen encouraged Williams to write for wind bands instead of orchestra, which works out well for us. Uh, using the rationale that a wider range of musicians and groups would play his music if he did. Williams was an American composer, pianist, French hornist, mellophonist, music theorist, conductor, and teacher. I imagine he willed in his spare time if he had any. Williams was known by symphony patrons as a virtuoso French hornist, with the symphony orchestras of Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Houston, Oklahoma City, Austin, and San Antonio. He was a close colleague of Alfred Reed at the University of Miami. Dedicatory Overture. Thank you. 
Veldrez is one of the most famous marches ever composed. The fact that it is evocative and expressive of its land of birth, Norway, is also significant. While march enthusiasts have typically been drawn to the vastly larger and better known repertoires of the United States, Germany, England, and Spain, Veldrez remains a greatly loved petite Norwegian tone poem, that's fun to say, in March time. Its composer, Johan Hansen, began his career as a tenor horn player in the Oslo Military Band in 1900. In 1903-1904, he composed Valdrez. The opening tune is a bugle call from the Valdrez Battalion. Valdrez is a valley in southern Norway. The second subject is an old tune for Hardinger Fiddle, the trio is a pentatonic tune based upon Norwegian folk music. Hansen began writing this march in 1901. It was not completed until 1904. Following its premiere, during an open-air concert in Oslo, the composer, who was playing trumpet in the band, heard only two people applaud. His two best friends. He then arranged the work for the orchestra of the National Theater, but Johann Halverson, the conductor and also a composer, turned it down. Later, he sold the march to a publisher for 25 kroner, which is about $5. From its inauspicious beginning, Valdrez March has become known in almost every country where there are brass or wind bands. Although it was his first written composition, Hansen admitted near the end of his life that he had never written anything better. Valdrez. Thank you. 
Uh, the next piece that you're going to hear tonight is actually a doubly special special event to me. It might be the I might be the only one who sees it that way, but it is what it is. I'll explain as I introduce the composer and the piece. Our next piece was written by Dr. David Biedenbender. And by the way, there are a lot of Daves in this story, so hang on. <laughs> Dr. Biedenbender was born in Waukesha, Wisconsin in 1984. He attended Central Michigan University where he received a bachelor's degree in music composition. He then went on to receive a master's and doctorate in music composition from the University of Michigan. He notes on his website that some of the prominent musical influences in his life were Evan Chambers, Kristen Kasten, Stephen Rush, Michael Doherty, and retired CMU professors David Gillingham and John Williamson. He is currently associate professor of composition at my alma mater, Michigan State University, after cutting his professional compositional teeth uh, in several other colleges. To our regular audience members, you, remember, you may remember that the composer of our tribute to Ken Plagius in The Is Gladness, Emmett Lewis, studies with Dr. Biedenbender at Michigan State. Tonight, the, leg the Legacy Band is pleased to perform Dr. Biedenbender's piece Before the Dawn, but with a little twist, I will not be conducting. Tonight's guest conductor is Dave Gott. He is the subject of Before the Dawn, which was commissioned by the Hazlitt Band Boosters in honor of Dave's, I told you there were a lot of them in this story, retirement from Hazlitt High School after 19 years of having an enormous impact on hundreds of kids. Prior to, leading to, prior to teaching at Hazlitt, Dave taught in Grayling. Dave, Dave also happens to be one of my dearest friends, a friendship that has lasted since we met nearly 21 years ago. I felt a strong need to give him the opportunity to conduct the piece that was composed in his honor. And it has been our pleasure to have Dave share the podium with us a few times in preparation for tonight. And it has been my honor to teach privately and clinic the Hazlitt bands over 20 years, actually 20 plus years, because I go back to some directors before him. And this is the very least I could do to say thank you for those musical experiences. When Dr. Biedenbender went to the school in Hazlitt to brainstorm ideas about the piece, he notes, what struck me most about the observations of memories of Mr. Gott and how he had helped so many of them do things they, they themselves did not think they could do, both personally and collectively. He saw a potential in them they could not yet see and helped them achieve their goals. He also comments, I am fortunate to call Dave Gott my friend. For as long as I've known them, he wakes up well before dawn, getting a head start on the day. And for me, this time is when the deep blue of the night sky moves towards the day through hues of red and orange in a time of hopefulness, joy, and optimism. My hope was that with this piece is to capture that feeling, the same optimism, hope, and inspiration that Mr. Gott brought to every student ever, uh, that ever entered his classroom. As a side note, which I didn't put in here, Dave has had, he has several college professors teaching that were students of his in Grayling, and uh, we both shared a student, and he was one of my private, just was um, accepted to Tanglewood on a fellowship this summer in Boston, so, uh, and a lot of that is his doing. So, yeah, we're going to sit here and argue back and forth, because trust me. <laughs> um, Dave is a devoted family man to his wife, Kate. Uh, son Connor, who is now at Michigan State, and daughter Madison, now at Central Michigan University. And Kate and Madison are here tonight to watch this. Thank you for coming. I want to thank the members of the Classic Legacy Band for uh, giving me this little selfish thing to have my friend conduct this piece. And um, please welcome to the podium, Mr. Dave Cott. Stay with me for 60 more seconds. I just want to show you something really awesome. Um, appreciate all the kind words, Dave. Thank you. Don't run away. Um, however, um, really, the optimism and the hope that Dr. Biedenbender writes about is all that are involved in music. And I want to show you this. Um, there were two band directors that were at a festival yesterday with their kids, got ones. One has hosted the festival here and is hosting us again.
but there are also a lot of people that were involved with music education. Would you raise your hand if you were involved in some way, shape, or form in music education? Out in the audience, too, because I, one of my good friends, band director out there. And, yeah, so, and then watch this. How many of us were inspired by at least one music teacher to be here? Uh. So the peace before the dawn is not just about the coffee that is required for all of us to get up early to do the things, <laughs> but is actually about the hope and the optimism and the inspiration that all of us provide in music, and that's the people that have come before us and will come after. Hope you enjoy.
We have a little gift for you in memory of tonight. Uh, Rachel Robbins, who was one of our uh, librarians and a bass clarinet player, who unfortunately, her employers decided she needs to move down to Warren to be part of the Warren concert band instead of ours, put this together. The score is the same score that you just heard. And um, I'm going to try to do this without dropping. Dr. Biedenbender was kind enough to autograph the score. And he says, today, thank you for helping so many believe in themselves and in the music. And also in here, just to make it look pretty, because he probably won't use it again, <laughs> is a baton made by our mutual friend, Mark Stikes, who oh. makes all of my batons that he did for me so that we could put it in here. This is also lighted, and in case you can't see it. Thank you so much. Wow. If any of you experienced goosebumps or even tears from what we just witnessed, you are my people. That was awesome. There is a movement in the final act of Aram Kachakurian's ballet, Gayan, where dancers display their skill with sabers. Cleverly, it's called saber dance. It's Kachakurian's best known and most recognizable work worldwide. Saber dance is considered one of the signature pieces of 20th century popular music. It was popularized by covers by pop artists, first in the US in 1948 and later elsewhere. Its use in a wide range of films and television over the decades have significantly contributed to its renown. Saber dance has also been used by a number of figure skaters from at least five countries in their performances. NPR described it as one of the catchiest, most familiar, perhaps most maddening, ooh, where'd that come from? Tunes to come out of the 20th century. It was featured in the Olympic ceremonies of the 2014 Winter Olympic Games in Sochi, Russia. Born in Georgia, not that Georgia, probably, in 1903, Kachikurian was a Soviet-Armenian conductor and composer. He was a member of the Union of Soviet Composers and served as its secretary until his death in 1978 at age 74. Saber dance. Thank you. 
Okay, you're about to truly learn just how much I'm a guy with a script that doesn't know much about any of this at all. Uh, I had no idea that that was Saber Dance. To me, that's the song from Pee Wee's Big Adventure. So, that's fun. I've learned today. <laughs> wow me. Um, our final piece is attributed to Klaus Bedet uh, from the film score, which was the result actually of a combined effort of nine composers. Hans Zimmer, Klaus Bedet, Ramin Djawaji, uh, James Dooley, Nick Glennie Smith, Steve Jablonski, Blake Neely, James McKee Smith, and Jeff Zanelli worked at a frantic pace to complete the music in three weeks' time. The reason behind the rush was that Alvin, Alan Silvestri, who was to be the original composer, had a creative disagreement with producer Jerry Brockhunger and walked out on the pr project. Now that's a creative disagreement. There have been critics' charges that the score was plagiarized from other cues, from other scores in the Remote Control Productions Library, which is Hans Zimmer's group. I think they probably figured that if you just put a stumbling Johnny Depp on the set, no one will notice. If you listen carefully, you might be able to recognize some of the music as being from the film Gladiator unquestionably different from traditional pirate film scores, Pirates of the Caribbean romps in a minor key that is nevertheless heroic in its emotion and intent. Symphonic Winds Medley includes the titles The Medallion Calls, The Black Pearl, To the Pirate Caves, One Last Shot, and He's a Pirate.